so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra Mutisauser Pereira. I am the head of nutrition for Action Against Hunger UK and I will be moderating today's discussion. Um, the, the reason why uh, I am uh, moderating this, uh, this discussion, uh, one of the reasons I think it's because I really like my accent. Uh, the second reason uh, is because the background of these uh, webinars um, is from um, uh, a group that uh, was formed two years ago based on a document that was published in uh, 2016 called Putting Kosher Core on the Map, where uh, we really uh, wanted to, to highlight the geographic repartition of, uh, of Kosher Core. I say we. Uh, even though it was my, uh, my predecessor at Action Against Hunger UK, who brilliantly uh, was, uh, was working on that uh, with, uh, with some other experts. So taking over, I really wanted to make sure that all the researchers working on Kwashaw Core, because unfortunately um, there are not that many, have a space, an informal space, where they can talk and, and exchange. So we, we came up with the idea of uh, developing a series of, uh, of webinars. And so this one is the third one, which is uh, part of this uh, series. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this group of informal researchers and practitioners working on Kwashaw Core, you will have my contact at the end of the webinar. Uh, contact me afterwards uh, and I can let you in. Um, so this series began in October. Uh, where we discussed the, the data on the characterization and the treatment of Koshoko at the time. In November, we reviewed the overt uh, signs of, uh, of Koshoko. Uh, and today we have an increasing number of uh, people participating. We are at 62 right now. Um, to to uh, listen to a, a bit of a different format, today will be more of a conversation turning around the metabolic and biochemical characterization of uh, Kwashaw Core. So next, uh, next slide, uh, Mary. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping items before we get into the, the discussion. Um, this webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours, and so we will hand uh, on, on before that. And I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Zoom now. This is definitely uh, uh, the application of the year. Um, and but just in case, on the bottom of the screen, you uh, actually have a few uh, functions. We will use both the chat and the Q&A buttons. So if you have any issues with the, the platform, like um, the sound is not working, please let us know through the chat. Although if the sound is not working, you might not hear me saying that. Um, so any other logistic issues, just use the chat. And if you have a question for the panelists, I will be the one uh, collect, collecting all those questions and making sure that they arrive at the right time. So please use the, the Q&A for that and I'll gather them. So uh, next slide, um, Mary. And today I'm really, really uh, thrilled uh, to be joined by um, six extremely uh, brilliant people for, uh, for this discussion. Uh, we have uh, Brian Gonzalez, uh, who have been with us uh, from the start of these webinars and really, really uh, called into the team that, uh, that developed them. And Brian is uh, the assistant professor at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and he's also the co-principal investigator of a project on Kwashaw Core Pathophysiology, which is led by MSF and Epicentre. And um, he also collaborates with the chain network on uh, Kwashaw Core research. Then we have Professor Asha Badalu, uh, who for many years has been really an integral member of the metabolism team, exploring metabolic differences between elematous and non-elematous childhood malnutrition at the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit in the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. We also have Dr. Robert Bansma, is a pediatric gastroenterologist nutritionist and translational scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children, Sick Kids in Toronto, Canada. His research focuses on elucidating the pathophysiological mechanisms underlying the vulnerability of malnourished children and develop novel therapies using both preclinical models and clinical studies. 
I think you are trying to, to trick me uh, into uh, trying to see if I would pronounce all of this right, Robert. Um, Jay Berkeley is also with us. Um, he's a professor of pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Oxford and is based in Kenya. Jay founded and co leads the Childhood Acute Illness and Nutrition Network, or called CHAIN, and he undertakes clinical trials among children with malnutrition and in neonates, as well as uh, mechanistic studies in infection, inflammation, and immunity. Dr. André Briand, do I need to introduce him, really? Uh, retired from WHO in 2009 and is now adjunct professor at the University of Tampere and affiliated professor uh, at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. He's also been uh, working uh, with uh, Mary Fitzpatrick, who's been on the call, uh, and Brian and, uh, and myself uh, for, for all this webinar. So thanks a lot, Andre. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Thaddeus May is trained in pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology and is an assistant professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He works, his work in Malawi um, is focused on understanding the nutritional causes of Kwashiorkor. So if I am not giving you uh, a lot of, uh, of experts uh, tonight to uh, uh, feed your appetite on knowledge of kosher core, um, I don't know what else to do. So in a moment, we will hear from Brian. Uh, and as I said, today will be a little bit different than the previous webinar, a bit of a different format, a bit more conversational. And um, Brian will, will provide you and explain the, the today's topic. But we will really focus on three topics. Um, one, uh, and next slide, Mary, I think. Uh, the chapter one on uh, macronutrient metabolism, chapter two on zooming in on liver dysfunction, and chapter three on albumin and, uh, and beyond. You will see that we'll spend quite a lot of time on micronutrient metabolism because um, we think that um, this is a topic that will probably generate the most um, discussions. And our, our speakers will debate some of the questions related to, uh, to each topic, and then Compared to uh, the last time, we will actually take a Q&A to take questions from the audience after each chapter. So uh, that means get ready quite early on to, uh, to ask your, uh, your questions. So don't hold your questions till the end and address them through the, the events. Uh, don't worry if they don't come to you uh, at first and if at the end you still have a question for chapter one. We, we will also save some time for, uh, for this, so no worries about that. Been talking way too much for a, a non-specialist on Kwashiorkor on this webinar, so I'm now turning it over to Brian. Thanks a lot. Hi, thank you very much, Alexandra, for your kind introduction and for introducing the entire panel. So um, for this uh, webinar, uh, we'll start uh, the, for a first chapter. Um, I will be presenting a major findings uh, that are reported on the metabolism of kosher core or edematous malnutrition. Then I will call on the panel to give their insights. Uh, just a disclaimer, it is my job to stimulate a discussion and not to say that I don't agree with anything, but um, we will try to challenge each of these findings so that we can have a better understanding of the metabolic dysregulation that occurs in kosher core. So next slide, please. I want to start with protein metabolism. So kosher core has been described as a protein problem. Uh, specifically, it has been uh, described as a protein intake problem. But using a metabolic tracer, so metabolic analysis using uh, by infusing uh, isotope labeled standards, in this case, leucine to a uh, kosher core and marasmic children, uh, Johor et al. and Manari et al. Uh, reported that uh, kosher core children actually have slower protein breakdown compared to marasmus. Um, but they tend to be higher than marasmus during rehabilitation. So when they're still fully edematous, they seem to have a protein breakdown that is slower than that of marasmus. And this could be related to the fact why we don't see as much wasting or as much uh, muscle uh, less, uh, why do we see more muscle and less muscle breakdown uh, in kosher core compared to marasmus. And this, this reflects the ability of kosher core children not to adapt very well to uh, an environment of a low nutrient, uh, uh, 
with no uh, with low nutrient availability. Sorry about that. Um, there's also a report of a slower rate of protein synthesis uh, in kosher core compared to marasmus, especially during active infection. Um, next slide. By the way, these are just uh, very broad uh, reports that I will be discussing uh, today. Uh, we, will, we will dig deeper into that during the panel discussions. Um, with regards to lipid metabolism in kosher core, it is well known that kosher core has higher, um, uh, higher association with uh, fatty liver. Um, there are also varying reports with regards to the baseline uh, serum or plasma lipid content in compared to uh, non-malnourished children. Some reports say that uh, kosher core children tend to have higher serum lipids than non-malnourished counterparts. And some, some reports also report that it's not actually um, different. But um, all of these uh, reports tend to agree that during rehabilitation or refeeding, of children with kosher core, their serum lipids increase to more than normal levels. Um, according to Badalu et al, and we're very lucky to have uh, Asha with us uh, today, um, they found out that using, uh, again, isotope labeled tracing studies, they found that there, is, there could be a less efficient fatty acid oxidation uh, in kosher core uh, compared to marasmus. Again, this reflects an inability of kosher core children to adapt to a low nutrient environment compared to marasmus, which could be the reason why we see higher mortality in kosher core compared to marasmus. Uh, for a final macronutrient, next slide, uh, carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, an older 1960s study uh, reported the association between glucose levels and, and fatty, free fatty acids in the plasma and insulin and in kosher core versus marasmus. In this study, they found that uh, consistently uh, in, in 12, 12 days of observation that in Marasmus children, they have low blood glucose levels, they have normal glucose tolerance test results, but they have low plasma free fatty acids and low plasma insulin levels, whereas for kosher core children, they observed that they have high free fatty acids, which uh, um, I mentioned already a while ago, they have an impaired glucose tolerance and they have somehow normal to high plasma insulin levels. However, more recently, much more recently in 2012, there is a study conducted by the lab of uh, Robert Bansma, which we are very lucky to have today. Um, and they found that kosher core and marasmus children actually have both have impaired glucose clearance and uh, insulin secretion. Um, and it is influenced by serum albumin levels, however. And uh, this is reflective of a disturbed beta cell function in both kosher core and marasmus. So that's it for my presentation. Um, for, for us to be, uh, if you do have questions on these specific, um, uh, on these specific references, uh, you can send me an email or tweet. Uh, I, I had my Twitter um, profile a while ago. Um, but now let's move to our panel. Um, to help us dissect and evaluate and even challenge some of these findings. So I request our panelists to please turn on your cameras. Hello, there we are. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so <clears throat> before we go deep into the metabolism of kosher core, I would like to start with Asha. So Asha, last year I was in Jamaica, we had a meeting and I was informed that the malnutrition ward in your hospital has recently been shut down. So can you share with us uh, this news? Why, why was it shut down? I think there are two main reasons. Well, thanks, Brian, and good morning to everyone. Um, there are two main reasons. I think the health centers are catching them early, so that they do not progress and they intervene, so the children do not progress to severe acute malnutrition. And also due to the availability of a cheaper source of milk, cheaper milk products. Uh, I think it points to the, the, the fact that maybe malnutrition is really a social issue. Because once, once they're able to get, the, when, when there's intervention and there is availability of, of food, um, adequate food, the prevalence is drastically reduced. Yeah, like most problems in the world, I think it is a, a social issue. There's a big social uh, aspect to it. So in fact, it is a good, it was shut down for good reasons, I think, because you don't see as much patients anymore as you 
have before, and I'm quite certain that your research efforts are, are very uh, help very much in, in having this achievement. So, yeah, congratulations to the team in Jamaica for having that. But I'm um, going back to the metabolism of of kosher core because many of these studies, in fact, me uh, these mechanistic studies were performed in Jamaica at the time. I'd like to ask you for your your general take on these results. Uh, what were your overarching um, hypothesis to begin with, and what were your overarching uh, conclusions based on these studies? Well, we never had an overarching hypothesis as such. There were more series of linked hypotheses. But maybe just to say the overarching aim of our work was to, to un try to uncover possible metabolic differences between edematous and non-edematous malnutrition that could contribute to a better understanding of the pathogenesis, the poorer prognosis, and even treatment in edematous severe acute malnutrition. And um, maybe the findings that I would like to highlight is that I think the data um, strongly support that there's an increased demand for cysteine in the acute phase of edematous severe acute malnutrition, which is not satisfied by the diet or protein turnover or synthesis from um, methionine, which is precursor for cysteine. So we are proposing that cysteine is conditionally essential during the early acute resuscitative phase of edematous SAM. And this is when that is really limited to match the fragile capacity, metabolic capacity at that stage. Um, maybe I should stop there. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, um, what, what I'm what I'm getting from from what you're saying is that um, there is this capacity issue, and it's not just that they are not eating enough cysteine or, or methionine, because cysteine is not really a, a, a an essential amino acid, is it? So, it's, it's not really an intake issue. What you're saying, it's it could be a capacity issue. Uh, am I understanding what you said correctly? Um, well. It, I think it's a, there's an increased demand. I think by looking at um, extensively at cysteine kinetics and metabolism in different at different stages, it's really it is really shown that there's an increased demand. I it's, it's going to maybe take too long to give all the studies and the, and the evidence, but there's an increased demand during the acute phase of of treatment during the early resuscitative phase, and I think mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, that's the main point here. Is yeah restricted to the acute phase when the intake is restricted um, at that stage is really until after tr um, treating infection and mineral and re um, replacing minerals deficiency and water imbalance, correct correction of water imbalances. So we are saying, but we, we think that there's an increased demand for cysteine at that stage of the treatment. And I, I maybe <laughs> I, I'm thinking that maybe the early phase treatment of edematous SAM may need what uh, RUTF1 enriched with sulfur amino acids and maybe aromatic amino acids that are also important for the synthesis of acute phase proteins for mm -hmm. fighting infection. So yeah. it's we're, we're particularly talking about the early resuscitative phase. Okay, but but isn't it Andre? Uh, you, you mentioned in your uh, Kosher core uh, still an enigma paper that uh, supplementation studies with cysteine um, did not really result in, in uh, big prevention of kosher core from happening, isn't it? Well, uh, are you referring to the study which was done in uh, Malawi, or are you referring to clinical studies? Actually, there were very few studies. I mean, this is a general comment I made the first during the first seminar. We have a lot of uh, in depth um, physiological studies, as, mentioned, as Asha, Asha mentioned, which are very interesting. But it did not go beyond, it did not go to an attempt to go to a randomized trial to test this hypothesis. Asha mentioned that maybe we need a IUTF for improve F75 in the initial phase of treatment with the increased level of some amino acid, which I am ready to accept. 
But to test the hypothesis, this hypothesis we can argue for years until we don't have some proper trial testing the idea. I think the, the discussion will become circular. So mm -hmm. this is why I don't know what to think at this stage. But uh, yeah. I want to ask you the same, I want to make the same comment and uh, ask Asha. So apparently I saw you put a lot of emphasis on this um, problem of cysteine in intake during treatment. But, but what, what about before? Because, you know, during the first webinar, Mary presented data suggesting that uh, in her study from DRC, children who, who lived in areas with a high prevalence of kosher code, apparently they had a lower protein intake and also lower sulfur amino acid intake. So what do you think uh, of the role of this sulfur amino acid in the, as a initial involvement in the pathogenesis of kosher code? In terms of the pathogenesis, um, well, it, it, it may contribute to the impairment in, in skin function or hair and, and hair and gut function because of their rich in cysteine. But we really started with looking at glutathione when it was shown that glutathione concentration is lower in edematous children and not the non-edematous children. And we measured the rate of synthesis directly. It was low in the edematous children. And then we continued to say, okay, why? Why? And we, we thought it was cysteine because cysteine is, the, of the three peak amino acids that are precursors for glutathione, cysteine was the lowest, observed the lowest in concentration in the edematous children with the supplementation. And it was um, glutathione concentration was stored in a short time. Uh, about nine to ten days. So we, um, then we we asked the question why why low in edematous and not edematous children? We looked at protein turnover. We found that there was a total um, reduced flux of cysteine and methionine and production of cysteine from methionine. There's increased uptake, um, splanchnic uptake of cysteine about 50% in both actually in the edematous and non-edematous children. Um, um, in terms of, uh, we also did a supplementation with methionine that did not, did, did not um, change the glutathione concentration. And that I th maybe there's a limitation to the conversion of methionine to cysteine, but there are demand also for methionine for other important processes in the body, uh, methylation of DNA and, and many others. We all, um, well, I mentioned this plantmic optic. Um, but I also like to point out that uh, there are, there is also a study coming out of Jamaica pointing to the prenatal effect of, of kosher core. So it, yes, yes. it could we, be programmed that the demand is indeed increased and that, you know, the diet is one factor, but it's not explaining um, everything, that there is a biochemical problem happening in these children that would require them probably to have more. Um, is, is my understanding correct, Asha? Yes, the, the, we're finding that, uh, we found that birth weight in the edematous children um, is about 333 grams on average, larger than that for marasmic children. And yes, there is a theory of, in, um, in utero effects and uh, the thrifty, thrifty gene um, story <laughs> for marasmic, that marasmic children are best, best adapted for famine versus kwashia core children. So there, there is that development, Dohad type developmental um, aspect. Yeah, although I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite curious and maybe the panel can enlighten me on this. The definition for Sam changed so in, in these studies in Jamaica, before they used the welcome trust classification, um, although the, the definition for kosher core did not really change, edema is still there, the definition of the comparator group, which is the marasmus, changed. You know, in, in the welcome trust, we have less than 60% for weight for age, whereas now we, we are more on weight for height and MUAC uh, definition. Does that, uh, do you think that the observations that we found in in Jamaica, for example, that used a different definition uh, would still persist if we use the new definition? 
What do you think, Andre? At this, I don't know, but definitely the, the definition change. And mm -hmm. uh, because, because uh, in Jamaica, they use the welcome classification, as you know, it is based on weight for age. So it does include a lot of children who are stunted. Having said that, the modern, so called modern definition, the WHO definition, is based on a double criterion, which is weight, low weight for height and low height. But uh, we know as well that among these children, there's a lot of stunted, uh, stunting as well. Yeah. So uh, I think you definitely raise a problem. We are not sure that the finding from the Jamaica can be extrapolated elsewhere because of this change of definition. But maybe it's true because stunting is prevalent everywhere in some children. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I would like to jump now to uh, to uh, glucose metabolism. So I'll, I'll point out to you, Robert. Um, you have performed a, a study on on um, a glucose homeostasis and, and insulin. What I did uh, what I did find in the paper is that these problems with glucose uh, metabolism seem to be associated with albumin levels as well. Um, and, and beta, dysfun uh, beta cell dysfunction. Can you give us more information about um, how is insulin uh, and, and glucose carbohydrate metabolism in, in, in uh, severe malnutrition? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Brian. So yeah, there are a lot of factors that, uh, that relate to glucose homeostasis. So you have hormonal regulation. The two most important hormones are insulin and glucagon. So what what uh, many studies have found is that there's definitely an endocrine pancreatic defect. So the pancreas is not able to uh, secrete as much insulin um, and it might be a bit more exacerbated in quartial core and might uh, also have an association with albumin. I don't see a clear pathophysiological uh, relation, but there's definitely an association. Um, Whereas uh, also other hormones like glucagon are also uh, uh, impaired, as in particularly so in quartial core. Some hormones that are involved in regulation of glucose homeostasis, such as cortisol and growth hormone, uh, seem to be um, uh, preserved. Um, so what you end up is that the two main regulators of glucose homeostasis, so glucagon kicks in once glucose levels are low, and stimulates the liver to produce more sugar, and that, that is defective. And on the other hand, if there's too much glucose in the system and needs to be taken up by tissues such as muscle, etc., cetera, for, for their own energy homeostasis, that process seems to be impaired. It's not, it doesn't seem to be at the, at the tissue level itself. So the, the tissues are responsive to, to insulin. So it's not an insulin resistance uh, problem that we see, for example, in obesity. Actually, these tissues appear to be very hungry for glucose, but they're just able, unable to absorb as much because there is not enough insulin to go around. Um, okay. so that's, that's, a, that's a clear clear finding. And we've had this discussion as well that insulin levels, in this case, also affect the way lipid metabolism occurs in, in, these, in these children, isn't it? Um, there, there, are, there is a report, of course, that the lipid metabolism is slower or lipid uh, oxidation is slower in, in kosher core compared to marasmus. And um, we had this discussion that the, the, we should not generalize uh, so much about this finding because of the insulin levels. But can you clarify that uh, comment? Yeah, sure. L let me just um, finalize one thing on the, on the insulin and, and, and glucose uh, story. So because you have low glucagon levels, um, that also affects your ability of, of the liver to produce sugar in times of, you know, um, a fat, for example. Uh, and apart from an intrinsic potentially defect in the liver to, to have these synthetic processes ongoing, like glucose production, there also seems to be an, uh, an effect of, you know, hormonal regulation and not, you know, stimulating the, glu the, the liver to produce more glucose. So that means that these children appear to be more prone to either hyperglycemia, so high glucose levels, as well as low glucose levels. So that's on the, on the glucose side of things. So insulin 
is also a main regulator of, of uh, lipid homeostasis. So um, at the adipose tissue level, through a, an hormone called uh, hormone-sensitive lipase, it, insulin prevents release from, these adipose, uh, from this adipose tissue, prevents the release of free fatty acids. So it keeps the triglycerides in the adipose tissue and, and prevents uh, hydrolysis into free fatty acids and release into the system. So if you don't have enough insulin, that potentially can you know, lead to an ongoing sort of mm -hmm. release of, of fatty acids into the system. So that, that's not completely consistent, I think, with uh, what, uh, what Asha's group has shown. Uh, and these studies were very elegantly done. I think, you know, in, in terms of research design, there were beautiful studies. Um, the only thing I think you can you can bring into that discussion, they were done in a very specific metabolic state. They were done after, I think, six to nine hours of, of fasting, when there's not a lot of insulin to go around anyway. So potentially there is an ongoing lipolytic flux, uh, but in this fasting condition, actually th there's there's uh, there is less less lipolysis, so less free fatty acid release into the system. So that's on so, the side. Uh, yeah. I'm only talking now about the release from adipose tissue into the bloodstream. Yeah, thank you. So that actually presents us with an opportunity because indeed, yeah, the the research that is done, and I what I particularly like about this research is that they are um, kinetic studies, and it, they are not just observational studies, and they're really elegantly done. And I don't think there are other groups that have performed you know research on kosher core to this extent so yeah th these are very useful uh, information now in the, in the final 10 minutes before we end this chapter i'd just like to have a rundown i'll, I'll start with you thad there is of course this um the, the most common uh, uh understanding for kosher core is this low protein and or low amino acid intake how much do you think are these um, metabolic dysregulations that we just presented? How, how much are they explained by poor protein intake? Um, thanks, Brian. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think that they may all very well be explained by low protein intake or low consumption or inadequate consumption of a nutrient that's contained within protein. Um, one of the challenges uh, with kwashiorkor, sure just like any problem, is discerning what's a cause and what's an effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, an effect might very well also function as a cause at some other level. It participates uh, subsequently in the, in the elaboration of the syndrome. So for instance, uh, we know from animal models that diets that are very low in the thionine and choline, for example, also result in uh, impaired uh, oxidation of fatty acids. And that impairment of fatty acid oxidation in Kwashiorkor, for example, as, an, as a, a hypothesis, might contribute to the uh, elaboration or pathogenesis of fatty liver disease in Kwashiorkor. So that's an example of, of how, uh, again, as a hypothesis, not something that's established, how a, a nutrient that's present in protein, again, methionine, might participate in the uh, pathogenesis of a molecular lesion that then then causes uh, a subcellular lesion which then again contributes to the overall pathogenesis of these organ level lesions so uh, teasing all of that apart is very difficult and um, it's uh, sort of uh, like looking at an ongoing uh, uh, combustion event a fire or something like that and trying to understand where the fire started can be can be really challenging, but uh, each year so we what I'm, yeah. what I'm getting here is that we have two fronts here. There could be low protein um, intake, but at the same time, as, as what Asha was uh, um, explaining a while ago, it could be that there's a higher demand. Uh, so even if you know there could be not really a deficiency, uh, because these children have very high demand uh, compared to normal, then that's probably one of the pathways that lead to kosher core. Um, we have five more minutes uh, remaining before we, we hand it over to Alexandra for questions. Um, my question here is, we've seen that there is a problem with insula, with insulin secretion, there is problem with glucose tolerance, there's high lipids, there is fatty liver. However, 
the way we treat kosher core right now, nutritionally, we give them F75, which is high, high in sugar. We give them RUTF, which is high in fat. So I'd like a reflection from the panel on how we think, are, are we treating the metabolic problem in kosher core correctly, uh, given the composition of the diet we're giving them? Um, I'll start with Jay, because Jay is really uh, in, in Kenya and uh, um, yeah, doing all these clinical trials. So what do you think, Jay? Um. I mean, it's, I think it seems logical that there's, there, there should be a different composition of um, feeds of well, F75, F100, RUTF uh, for the different phenotypes. Um, the problem is that we don't, because of the lack of sort of detailed knowledge, we don't know what those differences should be. And as far as I'm aware, no trials have specifically examined uh, differences in response to different compositions of feeds. Um, it might be, I mean, we, Robert and I ourselves have done sort of revised formulation of, RUT, of um, F75 and there's been other studies looking at formulations of, of RUTF. And I think there could be great opportunity in um, going back to the data from those, those trials. And, and although it wasn't necessarily one of the original objectives of the trial to actually look at responses um, differentially in um, wasting, wasting and, and kosher core. Um, so yeah, so currently there's no evidence to support uh, uh, different different types of treatment, but there are some sort of theoretical reasons uh, why they may differ. And I just wanted to go back to a point that Thad made, and I think others have touched on, which is, I mean, I think when we measure things um, and we find something is low, we tend to think of it in terms of a deficiency of deficiency of intake or storage. Um, and I think that the point about you know measuring thing we're measuring a snapshot of a highly dynamic uh, a highly dynamic process uh, and and so you know it's, it's perhaps only by sort of nudging the system by by giving say a larger amount of one particular nutrient whether it's cysteine choline you know methionine tryptophan whatever whatever it is and then measuring a sort of a response to that that i think we would really get any insight into what what the dynamics uh, are um yeah yeah um how about you andre you've worked of course in the development of these uh therapeutic feeds um is there a need to uh, create a specialized feed for kosher core to address these uh, metabolic problems uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, Jay, Jay, Jay and Robert could mention that we were, we spent a lot of time a few years ago thinking about uh, ways of improving um, F75 formula and uh, this led to, uh, to a trial with an alternative formula which is a uh, uh, less carbohydrate and more fat and uh, low, no lactose and so on. A lot of uh, change which we thought would uh, bring some improvement and the result was there was uh, absolutely no change in outcome. And as far as I remember, I, I agree with Jay, the sample size was not enough to disentangle, to examine separately what happened in Kwashoko and Marasmut, but as far as I could uh, see, there, there was no major Defense in any of these surplus. Maybe Robert can comment on that. No, I think you're right, uh, Andre. I think that was absolutely, uh, absolutely correct. So even though you, we come up with, you know, hypotheses based on these physiological uh, uh, experiments that have been done uh, that that are seem to be plausible, uh, but uh, the the actual reality is more uh, is more challenging. Um, one thing perhaps to add to that is there is some calorimetry data and we've, we've also recently actually Frasana, Frosi and Prisca Rari and uh, um, um, Fernas Krasnefisan uh, in Bangladesh and, and Malawi respectively, they've done a calorimetry study where it seems that, that especially early on when these children are hospitalized, their energy um, the energy expenditure, so how much energy they actually produce or need, uh, seems to be quite different. So if you, if you think about F75, where we give you know 90 to 95 kilocals per kg per day, 
with a lot of macronutrients that they need to oxidize and, and, and utilize. If there are defects there and overall metabolic rate is, is much lower in core core, perhaps it makes sense to give fewer calories early on in that, in that process. That's, I think, something to bring into the discussion. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess that's for now. Uh, we can stop there. Let's ask uh, Alexandra if we have some interesting questions uh, coming from the audience. Yes, uh, so they came a, a little bit uh, just, just now. Um, so uh, glad to see uh, that people were very attentive and uh, now uh, um, asking questions. So we have a, a question which is quite clinical. I'm not sure we have enough uh, details, but we'll give it a try because it's actually about uh, a particular case. Uh, and I know that myself, I would need a little bit more information to be able to answer, but let's give it a shot. So um, we have a question regarding a Kwashiorkor patient who is in outpatient treatment, whose weight has been fluctuating, but the edema subsized. And they had initially referred, they tried to uh, refer the child back in, in inpatient because um, the child actually crossed edemas and uh, they tested the child is HIV and TB negative, what would you um, advise? And I am very <laughs> aware that I uh, think we would need a bit more information, but maybe um, maybe one of you might want to, to take that and uh, and maybe say, like, you know, what are the other information that we need? Unfortunately, unfortunately we can't chat, but um, uh, would somebody want to take that question? Yeah, so I, I'd like to I'd certainly like to know how much the weight is changing, but I think you have to bear in mind that weight changes over a very short period of time are likely to be entirely due to fluid changes, and so there may well be there may well be edema coming and going, which is maybe not so clinically obvious. Um, there may well be something you know there could be a, a an ongoing infection. The, the, I mean, in our sort of years of practice, when we see uh, sort of children who just don't respond or who are, on the, who are inpatients already, it's usually only one of two things. One is that they're not taking the feeds, or, and the other one is that they have, some, a lot, they have some chronic other abnormality, and usually it's an infection. A TB was a good, a, a good suggestion, but there are you know, other possibilities for so in, in sort of a more detailed medical investigation uh, for infection. But also just to get more, yeah, more details on the amount of weight change and over what period, because a very short period weight changes can only be really due to fluid changes. Yeah, thanks. I, I would suggest, Samira, uh, I will put everybody's email afterwards. Uh, maybe if you want to follow up with, uh, with one of our uh, experts, um, because I think we need more, uh, more details. Um, I have one more question that uh, is, is interesting, uh, long. Uh, a bit controversial, but definitely on the point. Um, that one of the big tension in my nutrition research and programs is that commercial feeds are too expensive, cost per child treated are too high, and therefore program coverage is limited to high incidence area, missing so many children. There is a movement to standardize feeds across MAM and SAM and uh, CMAM plus uh, HIV programs. Is suggesting further sub-specialist feeds not likely to further increase program costs and limit our ability to scale CMAM beyond its current uh, limits. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I know who I want to address this question to, and he knows, um, but uh, do I have a volunteer otherwise to take that question? Otherwise, Andre. It's one for you. I think I will say something very trivial. I mean, we are all in favor of reducing the cost of treatment. The big question is how to do that. You know, there have been many attempts to, to reduce the cost of RUTF over the recent years. And uh, so far there was no dramatic change. So I don't know, I don't know, I don't have an easy answer to that. The problem yeah, is that I mean, the cost I, I of have, this was... Yeah. No, go first. Also, yes. So uh, I don't have an easy answer to that. I wish uh, I wish we could have these uh, products at a very low price. And <laughs> but, uh, at this stage, it's a bit of a wishful thinking. If anybody has a solution, please let me know. 
Yeah, no, I, and I agree um, because I, uh, I, uh, I also agree that we, we work a lot on this, uh, obviously, uh, and uh, making sure that you reduce the cost to increase the coverage doesn't mean that uh, if you find that the product is not the best for a child and uh, increases the length of stay and uh, potentially also causes relapses in children because it doesn't work that well, um, you also have a responsibility here. That's where I have no solutions. I the, the, this uh, is part of, of the problem. This is part of the problem is that there have been alternative for formula which have been proposed were slightly less expensive, but uh, by and large they result in lower weight gain. And the treatment duration is mathematically is related to the rate of weight gain. So if you have product which result in lower weight gain, the saving is minimum. It's minimum. Yeah. So uh, I don't have a magic answer to that. Andre, is coverage ever estimated as part of uh, that assessment? Because I think the question is specific to, you know, there may be a, a, a trade-off between longer longer treatment and getting better coverage if it costs the costs are the same. I I, I will just take this one, James, uh, simply because actually the the team I work with in the UK office is a team of uh, coverage specialists, and I have to say. Um, there is not enough research done on simplified approaches that includes coverage. Um, and uh, we have to be very careful because we can't just make assumptions on uh, the fact that reducing costs can increase coverage. We need to look at both. Um, so we need to be very careful with that. I'm going to move on um, because we will have also some, some time at the end for more general questions. And that's a bit of a general question. So, um, Brian, I will leave you the floor on liver dysfunction. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't really been saying my opinions, but I'll just pitch one opinion uh, um, on that last, last question. Uh, I'll just like to say that, uh, yes, it is very important, practically speaking and logistically speaking, to take these into account. However, that's a problem that we can tackle once the product is there. There's really no point discussing all these if we don't have any product in, you know, I think that children with malnutrition deserves as much research uh, as, as a person in, in, in Europe. And we, we are spending a lot of money here in Europe for precision nutrition. And I think uh, it's just fair that we also try to look at what's best for them. And then maybe we can find a logistical solution. That's just uh, an opinion. So there. Ryan, um, you we went a bit quieter again. If you could just increase your, your voice, uh, we are facing the, the problem again. Oh, how about you now? Need to shout. Oh, really? Okay, that, that's that's a pity. Um, but I, I hope my voice is still there, though. It's back now. Okay, it's back. Um, yeah, I, I will not repeat what I said. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just to say that um, all these this uh, all these problems that we've uh, that we've discussed uh, a while ago, um, you know. Uh, Carbohydrate metabolism problem, increased uh, liver fat, uh, increased uh, serum fatty acids, and, and problems with protein metabolism, they seem to all boil down to one central organ, and that is the liver. Of course, there are other organs that are responsible, but you know, the liver seems to be something that a kosher core child seems to be having a problem on. So for this next uh, chapter of this discussion, we'd like to zoom in on the liver liver function in kosher core and the role of liver metabolism in explaining the pathophysiology of kosher core. I will not be presenting any slides. Let's just go straight to our panelists. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite our panelists back uh, on a translational research. Um, I, I, I poised this question to Thad and Robert being hepatologists. Just a question, how dangerous is having fatty liver? In a, in a child, in a malnourished child, is it something comparable to a fatty liver we see in, in obesity contexts? And are we doing something specifically to address fatty liver um, in, in kosher core? Uh, Thad, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I, the, the presence of fat in the liver is um, quite common, and thankfully it's not lethal most of the time. So I think to say that it's particularly dangerous um, would be uh, to misrepresent the problem. Um, and that's certainly the case uh, in, in rich countries in North America, Europe, and Asia as well. So, but the, 
the presence of fat in the liver, especially when it's associated with the undernutrition, seems to be well correlated with metabolic dysfunction. And so it's, a, it's an early sign. And if we, you know, looking back at some of the, the uh, post-mortem studies in Uganda and uh, serial biopsies done in South Africa, there is a, a sense uh, as early as the, the late 1940s that fatty liver in Kwashiorkor is the first pathological lesion to come and the last to leave. Um, and, uh, you know, that suggests that whatever is happening in Kwashiorkor at a nutritional level, uh, and also at a, at a subcellular level with regards to its underlying disturbances that it, it's, it centers on the pathogenesis of a fatty liver. So it's, it's a sign that may give us important clues for understanding how we can do a better job of preventing and treating Kwashiorkor. Yeah, but it's not really something we are monitoring, isn't it, Robert? No, it is actually very difficult to monitor, and I would like to echo that's I think elegant uh, explanation. If we, you know, the the disease that's, uh, you know, the main disease that involves the fatty liver is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is projected or I think already is now the main indication for liver transplantation. So definitely, it's it 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 can be detrimental uh, for the liver, but that's usually you know years long process. It's a chronic, slow deterioration. Uh, that doesn't necessarily exclude the possibility that having fat in the liver and especially certain certain lipid species can be lipotoxic and further cause damage to the liver. Um, but I, I agree with that. I don't. I think it's a sign. But I, I, my thought is that it probably doesn't contribute considerably to to its poor function. It's a sign of poor function. But uh, it's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, but both of you have, have been um, researching on a, a, a preclinical pre setting on the pathogenesis of this fatty liver. So I'll start with you, Thad. What have you learned so far using animal models on how these, fatty li uh, how these uh, lipid accumulates in, in uh, the livers of malnourished, uh, in, in a malnourished state? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, it's an interesting topic, and uh, people have been interested in, in it for a long time. You know, and as early as um, 1920, uh, they were uh, trying to use uh, uh, certain nutrients, macronutrients, casein in that, in that case, to prevent the pathogenesis of edema and fatty liver in an animal model of, of uh, nutritional edema. Uh, and then later on, uh, in, the, um, in the early 50s, late 40s, people started using uh, one carbon nutrients in isolation, and so that would be, th those are B12, folate, methionine, and choline to prevent the pathogenesis of fatty liver and edema in animal models of nutritional edema. Uh, and those were murine models, not uh, primate models. And so, you know, all that suggests that um, the pathogenesis of uh, fatty liver disease in Kwashiorkor uh, may have something to do with uh, nutrients that uh, fit into the, the category of one carbon nutrients or nutrients that support efficient movement of one carbon units or as we learned in, in uh, chemistry class methyl groups. And so that's really where my interest came in. And so um, in just a, in a small study with, with, uh, that's um, you've been uh, uh, probably maybe perhaps read, Brian, we used choline to prevent fatty, the pathogenesis of fatty liver disease in weanling mice. And, um, you know, we were, it, was, it was unexpected uh, for us to, to see how well choline prevented the pathogenesis of fatty liver in those mice subsisting on a pretty poor diet. Well, choline in this case would be helpful in the packaging of, of the, the, the lipids, right? To, to take it out of the liver. Um, but Robert, I, I know that you have a, a different or, or maybe a, a similar mechanism um, th th that you, you found out in your animal models. Can you uh, give us more explanation about it? What have you found out in, in, in animal models? Yeah, I, I think uh, Thad and I are looking at, I think, somewhat similar pathways, but uh, from a slightly different angle. So if you look at, you know, how does fat get into the liver? There, there are a couple of options. So one is the liver is making more fat, uh, which is what we see in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's probably not the case in Corsio core. The other thing is, and that uh, brings us back to uh, Asha's experiments, uh, is there more influx into the liver of, of, of lipids? Um, so Asha's experiments suggest that that's 
perhaps not the case. Um, um, so the, the third option is that the liver is not able to secrete the, the lipids uh, out of the liver because that's normally what the liver does. It, it's, it basically, it's a, it's a logistical center and it accepts lipids and then sends it out again to the tissues. Um, and also, I think that's also work from, I think that the same, the same team has shown that the export of lipids out of the liver is uh, probably preserved, if course your core. So there is some data and that comes back to Mike Golden's data early on, this post-mortem data that Thad alluded to, is that they found the mitochondria to be quite uh, abnormal in, in shape. Um, uh, and there's also some clinical data and we have some preclinical data to indicate that actually the energy factories of the cells, of the liver cells, the mitochondria are, are really impaired. Uh, and that's work from also from students in my lab, but that's also earlier work to to suggest that. Um, and that so if these energy factories are are really impaired, uh, that can lead to defects in in the oxidation of lipids. But then if you if you can't oxidize your nutrients, can't oxidize your lipids, then you also run into trouble in maintaining all these essential synthetic processes like producing albumin, producing glucose. Um, producing, um, you know, clotting factors, you know, uh, yeah, cytokines, so etc. Yeah. So, uh, um, with the, we, so there is a problem with the liver. Uh, there is a problem with metabolism. But we also know that in kosher core, they 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 tend to have higher mortality rates. Now, I, I'm just curious. So, I, I will direct this question to you, Jay. The reasons for, for increased risk for mortality in kosher core or, or in SAM in general, are any of these directly related to metabolic dysfunction or the liver dysfunction? Okay, um, the studies that I've looked at um, do vary a little bit. Some of them do have an a higher mortality for kosher core and um, some of them have a, a, a lower or similar mortality for kosher core and wasting. I think it also very much depends on the setting. And we have to remember that a lot of the earlier work was done before the sort of current differentiation into complicated and uncomplicated uh, severe acute malnutrition. So that, that makes quite a difference. Um, I think there's no doubt that when um, the, the, the children with kosher core are more difficult to manage. They're, they're more on a knife edge. You, you know, if you look at their fluid balance, you give, give them too much, they have a problem. You give them too little, they have a problem. And that sort of that that space that the, the space that you can operate in sometimes just gets narrower and narrower. So they are very difficult to manage. And if you think about it, if that child was admitted in Oxford. Uh, they would be in intensive care. They would have all kinds of monitors and the sort of all their central venous pressures and everything else would be being monitored. And uh, you know, all all of the metabolic things would be being monitored as well. And so, you know, I think it also depends on the setting that you're you're, you're working in. I think in settings where children, you know, where there's a sort of a high level of medical care, I think tend to be the ones where the, there's not so much difference in in mortality. I think where medical care is less good, uh, then they're likely to have much higher mortality. There's some evidence they have an increased susceptibility to bacterial infection, which is also actually seen in other edematous diseases. So it's not just in, uh, in kosher core. So I think that, that, you know, again, you know, whether you're, it's a center which is sort of able to aggressively treat infection, manage fluids, um, can keep keep the keep the mortality more similar. Does, does, yeah. does that answer? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So I'm I'm just wondering because you know um, infections and inflammation. Uh, inflammation itself also causes fatty liver disease. It, it also um, it it also eats up a lot of methionine. So it it could explain why we see very reduced levels of of, of uh, amino acids in, in circulation. It also explains, you know, it's a albumin is a negative uh, acute phase protein. So inflammation could also explain why there is low albumin in kosher core. Um, no, just for a mm -hmm. final, a final question, I'm just wondering, it could be that what we're seeing is just an artifact of having a child that's more inflamed than the other one, is it? Yeah, I mean, there's a several studies which have looked at inflammatory markers, acute phase proteins, cytokines, 
um, comparing Kwashiorkor and marasmic children. And they all show the same thing. They all show that children with marasmus are fantastically more inflamed. Um, they have much higher levels of these uh, inflammatory proteins. And I think that's interesting from two points of view. The first point of view is that they obviously then don't have any problem synthesizing those proteins. <laughs> uh, they may have problems synthesizing albumin, they may have problems uh, fulfilling all kinds of other metabolic requirements, um, but they certainly don't have a major problem in, in generating very high levels of CRP and the pro-inflammatory cytokines, other acute phase proteins. And I think that tells us something. And, and as you say, the, the infl inflammation itself is a real driver of abnormal lipid metabolism. You know, you get increased triglyc circulating triglycerides. Uh, and, it, and it's a real drive, it's a real, uh, so yeah, it has direct effects on things like uh, ability to break down protein and, and, and metabolize protein. And uh, at the same time, you're going to be using a lot of sort of basic building blocks in order to make those pro-inflammatory um, responses. And so some of the things that we see as oh, look, they're deficient in this, may simply that they're, be that they're churning through it very rapidly in this huge uh, inflammatory response. And yeah, absolutely. Just, just to add as well that, yet yeah, many of these cytokines are sulfated proteins. So, you know, the reason yeah. why we are, we are seeing less sulfated amino acids is probably because they are converted into these cytokines that we were not measuring before. The, the interesting thing is that we haven't yet got a good description of the inflammatory environment compared to say the skin changes and mm -hmm. things like that, which, which I mean, the skin changes look like, you know, other things which are very pro, very sort of inflammatory type conditions. And whether there's a, a different inflammatory environment with children with Kwashiorkor plus skin changes from those without skin changes, uh, we don't yet have a good idea. But I saw Debbie it's actually on the call. There's various people interested in this. Uh, so yeah, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Any input on that? All right. So, uh, Brian? Yeah, I have... I'm about to talk to Alexandra now. Good, you're here. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of questions. So that's why I let you go on a little bit. Um, we, we actually had a, had a question that you, you, you had <laughs> for your panel, uh, which was about the, the mapping, the, the main causes of death. Uh, and is are the deaths linked to uh, the syndrome itself or more linked to its management? But I think that's what exactly what you were answering, Jay. So um, fabulous. We have another question, um, which is maybe not fully liver, um, but uh, it's about the, the differences in Marasmus version, Kwashiorkor, and what are actually the profile in, in those mixed presentations? And by profile, um, the, the person means the differences in glucose, lipping, serum, uh, et cetera. Um, so the person would like to hear a bit more about that. So I, I, I understand that they, they, the, the, the person was asking about marasmic quash patients. Uh, yeah, the differences between marasmus and quash in terms of uh, the, the profile of the lipid, glucose, serum profile. What are the differences? Well, okay. Um, I, I think I can answer that. Uh, now we have we have focused indeed on specific macronutrients, right? A protein um, metabolism. But in terms of uh, the profile of lipids, I don't think that we've seen a lot of evidence or like a lipidomic uh, comparison, for example, of quash versus marasmus. Um, I have seen uh, papers suggesting that there are higher um, lipid, um, lipid con uh, like serum concentrations of inflammatory lipids, like leukotrienes and prostaglandins are increased in, in kosher core, which could be related to this, this painful cry that uh, Regina was, uh, was uh, alluding to uh, in, in the previous uh, webinar series. We know that the erythrocytes in kosher core have a different, um, different uh, lipid profile with, with marasmus. But I think now that the technology for profiling lipids and proteins and metabolites are just recently being, um, being used, it, it really provides a very good opportunity. Um, I just, just like to say one thing. We, we, we often say that, okay, we see small, you know, lower methionine or lower this or lower that in kosher core compared to marasmus. 
but I'd like to highlight uh, a paper published by Robert's group, uh, Di Giovanni uh, et al. Um, on the metabolomic uh, differences between Kosherkor and Erasmus. And you will see in that paper that majority, if not all of the metabolites they found were actually lower in Kosherkor. So it's not just methionine, it's not just individual amino acid, it appears that a lot of these, uh, an entire profile is actually lower in kosher core, which as a chemist, I, I would like to question, is this a matter of dilution? Is there a, is, is, does edema cause a dilution in the blood of these children? I don't know the answer, so. Okay. We'll have to, to, uh, to, to move on. There is an interesting question. I'm pretty sure we don't have the answer, but it's definitely, I think, a good research question. Um, the question is, what are the determinants of kwashiorkor core during pregnancy, which makes a newborn more susceptible for kwashiorkor? core? If somebody has an answer to that, um, it, it would be fabulous. Um, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure anybody looked for this. Yeah, I type a response to say that I don't think anybody knows, and if I, unless anybody else on the panel knows, I don't think so. I think that the, 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 the I should mention the birth weight differences between Quash and Merasmus, uh, whether that's a specific metabolic effect or whether it's just simply that low birth weight is a risk factor for wasting and perhaps less so for, uh, for Quash or Core, we don't, we don't yet know. But in terms of um, for sort of you know nutritional or inflammatory or infective insults during pregnancy, we don't know. Uh, there certainly has not been uh, the kinds of uh, epigenetic studies um, which could be done at birth, for example, if you have collected you know sort of detailed information on maternal exposures, maternal health, uh, fetal growth during pregnancy. Uh, collected samples for epigenetics at birth and then waited to see who got Merasmus. But, but that would be a very, diff you know, very big, very difficult, yeah. uh, expensive uh, study. So it would be diff difficult to know how that could be done. There are some areas where there are live banks of, uh, of cord blood which has been sampled. So it is maybe possible that uh, sort of that could be done retrospectively in some places going, you know, looking at kosher core cases and going back in sort of centers that have, you know, demographic surveillance and who may have stored a, uh, a cord blood sample, then looking at some epigenetic markers. But then again, you'd have to decide what to look at. There's been some work in the Gambia looking at the sort of balance of, uh, you know, thrifty energy saving versus ability to mount responses against infection. Uh, and that look, looks like quite a promising uh, area, although it doesn't deal specifically with the, the issue of edema and Koshiko. Thanks, uh, Jay. And uh, so, Brian, I'll uh, give you the floor for uh, the last chapter on uh, albumin and beyond. You have only five minutes and six minutes for uh, your discussion with your panel. I have a very, very strict timekeeper, so <laughs> let's let's get on with it then. So, we there are two schools of thought in kosher core and, and albumin. And albumin is very interesting to discuss in this case because as we alluded to a while ago, there is an association between albumin and insulin and albumin and liver dysfunction. So it would be, uh, you know, we would be remiss not to discuss albumin and kosher core. So one school of thought is that the cause of kosher core could be related to the low albumin and the other school of thought is that there's no association at all. Where do we stand on that? And I'll just like to go uh, um, to all of our panelists to have a very quick, you know, um, comment about the role of albumin. I would just like to say that we are intending to have a different webinar to discuss albumin in detail, but uh, yeah. In the next five minutes, let's just give one minute to each. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Andre. I hope a minute is enough for you. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Uh, you refer to two schools of thought, and I think the hypothesis that, I mean, the discussion focused mainly on the relationship between albima, albumin and edema. And there's one school of thought which thinks that albumin is a causal contributing factor to edema, and the other one claim it is not. 
but the hypothesis of albumin being a potential contributing factor was revived by a paper by a Martin, my Kulta, Professor Kulta, a few, two or three years ago. And what he did is that he criticized one of the paper from Jamaica who claimed there was no relationship. And he made a very extensive review of the literature and found that there was, edema was always associated with a, on average, lower albumin concentration, plasma albumin concentration. Of course, with considerable overlap, but on average, the picture is very clear. And he also reanalyzed the paper by uh, Golden and the Jamaica group, which claimed there was no relationship, and he showed there was a problem in the analysis. There was no statistical analysis and so on. So this unique paper, which found no association, is to put in perspective with all the other paper, which showed that on average albumin is lower in, uh, in Kwashoka compared to Marasmus. So, and interestingly, you know, that uh, Mike Golden and uh, Alan Jackson responded to this paper and they did not come out at all on the analysis of their findings, so which uh, <laughs> means that uh, potentially there is a problem here. Now the other question again is, the next question is whether this association is, a, is just an association or whether there is a cause or effect relationship. So to be clear, I don't know the answer to that. What is uh, what is sure is that um, my golden claim that there was the, it was non-causal and he based uh, his argument mainly on the saying that the Starling principle is something which has been abandoned by physiologists and so on. So he claims that albumin has no role in the fluid transfer. But uh, after reading his paper, I'm not sure <coughs> it's so clear because uh, there are two different things. There's a Starling principle and Starling uh, hypothesis. Starling hypothesis definitely is rejected. It's a hypothesis claiming that the, there's fluid at one end of the capillary in one way and the other way at the, at the other end of the capillary. And this is clearly abundant. But the, the Starling principle, which is based on the bio biophysical law is still there. It's based on the second principle of thermodynamics. And when you look at the equation, uh, describing uh, the fluid transfer. Clearly there is a albumin is there, but there are yeah. many other factors. So which one is predominant? To this day, we don't know. Uh, again, so many association is not causation. It's very difficult to, to disentangle the problem. So I think the, the question is still open. Yeah. So since you mentioned about the, the Jamaican team, why don't we ask Asha, what's the feel there? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and I was not really part of those studies. Um, but I was want to point out that we, there is low albumin in some marismic children also. Um, and um, just to make a point, I think one of the questions was really about quasher core and marismic quasher core as classified by the welcome classification. And those two syndromes are lumped together, I think, as quasher core. And there might be differences really in, in the metabolism of the non-wasted kosher core and the marismic kosher core, which is more, more wasted in terms mm -hmm. of the, the, the question before and uh, maybe with albumin and I, I, I don't really know the answer neither. But it's interesting to know that it is, there's, it is low in some non edematous children. Yeah. But also to, to, to just say that indeed that third intermediate group, which marasmic quash, it's not really researched a lot, is it? But no. if you look at the mortality of these children, they are actually the highest mortality group. So that's quite interesting. Um, I'll pass it to, to Jay. Just very quickly, uh, right. before Alexandra shoots us, <laughs> albumin and, and quash are core. What do you think? Well, I think that the, the higher mortality in the marasmic quash points to me to them being two different mechanisms and you have the contribution of mortality from each mechanism. I mean, we've looked at the literature where we've actually got a lot of our own data now on albumin levels uh, in quash or core, different grades of quash or core. And there is certainly a very strong association between having edema and the degree of edema with the level of albumin. However, there are also some children without edema who have very low albumin. So although there's a strong association, we do see 
the, the low, very low albumin, although you're more likely to have kosher core at very low albumin levels, not every child does have kosher core. And so I think my reading of the situation is that so albumin does play a role, um, it, but it's not uh, sufficient to account for the whole thing because having low albumin doesn't make everybody have kosher core. Um, so there's another factor which means that when you, when in the presence of low albumin, you go ahead. You go on to get kosher core. We're not really seeing any kids with kosher core with normal or high levels of albumin at all, whereas you do see that in some of the marasmic kids. Yes, thank you. Um, Fad, what do you think on, on a hepatology uh, perspective? Uh, yeah, where I, do you stand on that debate? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough question. I, I, I don't know if I have a uh, a lot more insight than uh, Jay or Andre would have, but I, I think within the malnutrition research community, we shouldn't feel singled out for having a, 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 a sometimes complex uh, understanding of uh, what's going on with albumin and edema. The same thing happens in uh, adult patients who have uh, sometimes massive ascites or edema, but have uh, you know completely normal albumin levels. Uh, or, and, the, and the converse is also true. So the pathogenesis of edema and its relationship to hypoalbuminemia is, is not only uncertain in kwashiorkor, core, but also in, in a number of different disease conditions. And so I think the, there's still a lot of basic science research that needs to be done on this topic. And uh, so I, again, I don't, I don't think there's something particularly unique about this um, sometimes very complex and difficult to understand relationship of albumin and edema in kwashiorkor. core. Finally, Robert, would you like to wrap things up with your, <laughs> with your no, opinion? I, no, I think uh, Thet and, and Jay and the others, I think uh, they all made very valid uh, points. For me as a clinician taking care of children with end-stage liver disease who often have very low albumin because of, uh, you know, the liver is not able to produce the albumin. Definitely, you know, it's well accepted we treat. If, if the ascites, the, 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 the fluid, fluid accumulation becomes uh, challenging to manage with diuretics, uh, and the albumin is very low, we give them albumin uh, and uh, usually they respond. So there's, I, I think both Ted and Jay, I think said it nicely. It, it, it's not black and white, it's not either or, it probably plays some sort of role, but it's definitely not the whole picture. If you want to talk about, you know, why the albumin is low, I think, you know, also based on, on Asha's work, there's definitely a synthetic issue with producing albumin, but whether, for example, partial core patients have more protein loose and enteropathy, so lose more proteins, or they have more renal loss of, of, uh, of protein, proteinuria. I mean, there, there's so much we don't know yet around, you know, the homeostasis of albumin. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, of course, my final note uh, with regards to what Andre said uh, about the, the starting principle, um, or the fluid movement, the, the main, one of the main, you know, main characters of that principle is having the semi-permeable membrane in between that allows for certain solutes to go out. And even Mike Golden suggested that that, you know, with the glycosaminoglycans, that barrier could be destroyed. So if you indeed destroy that barrier, then, you know, this principle of movement, flu uh, fluid movement by osmosis is then you know, not functioning anymore. But as I said, we will have a different webinar on the albumin. It's an entirely or even three webinars. And uh, let's see the, the, what the audience thinks from Alexandra. Yeah, so you were, you were lucky I, uh, I didn't shoot you. I do not shoot people. Uh, I'm anti-guns. Um, yeah, there was a question uh, but not, not too many, so I'll let you go on. Um, so one question is uh, very specific, uh, asking if there is any specific alteration in fatty acid metabolism in Kwashiorkor children. Somebody wants to take this. I guess that's something that we discussed uh, in, in the first chapter. Uh, there, yeah. As we mentioned, there is, just to repeat, there is uh, there are suggest uh, there are reports suggesting that the lipid metabolism, uh, lipid oxidation in kosher core is lower uh, than in marasmus. But as Robert mentioned, we have to take this uh, 
in the right context. Uh, these experiments were performed in fasted situations, and it's probably interesting to compare it in a non-fasted state because of the effect of insulin to lipid oxidation. So, yes. Thanks, Brian. So um, I think I don't have uh, any more questions at, uh, at this stage. So I will uh, give you three minutes to uh, sum up the, the discussions. Um, well, basically, do whatever you want, but it's three minutes. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get something additional from someone, uh, go for it. Um, but uh, three minutes. <laughs> I can give my one minute to anybody who'd like to uh, give a, a, a parting word. I, I see I, I Jay. To ask a question of, Rob, of Robert, actually, but uh, is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Unacceptable and accepted. Uh, Robert, Robert, you touched on the uh, sort of mitochondrial issues, um, and there's not only the mitochondria, but the peroxisomes, which are also potentially sort of central players. To what extent do you think that the both, if you took a combination of peroxisome and mitochondria, whether that really would account for almost everything that we see in quashiocore? core? If we're looking for a central, one single central uh, sort of driving mechanism with a cause rather than an effect? I, I think the mitochondria, I, I think that that's, I think, an hypothesis that, that we have, that, that it indeed plays a central role in in the metabolic disturbances that's uh, arising in the liver. Uh, peroxisomes is a bit more tricky. Peroxisomes do a lot of different things. You know, one uh, particular function is that they um, regulate oxidative stress and re reactive oxygen species. And we know that crucial core is associated with increased oxidative stress that has also been uh, hypothesized to be involved in the pathogenesis as well. Uh, and they definitely can, you know, if, if you don't have peroxisomes, you get more oxidative stress and that can damage cells in many ways, including damaging the mitochondria and cause cell death. Uh, so there might be a role of, of peroxisomes uh, there, but, and also my goal and actually already, I think 40 years ago found a decrease in peroxisomes. It's not something that we discovered. It, it was reported uh, uh, a long time ago. Um, but definitely I think that the mitochondria, is, they, they are such, key players in, in, in cell health, cellular health, and, and in you know, creating, you know, generating the energy to drive all these processes that the liver needs to do, uh, including, for example, you know, um, hepatobiliary function. We didn't even talk about the ability to, to make bile, which is very important for digestion of nutrients. And that's found to be uh, impaired as well in core uh, with studies from the late 60s. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I do, I, that might be at least part of a sort of a play a role in a, a sort of a uniform, um, framework of hypothetical pathophysiological model that we can build. Um, so I definitely believe that, that they're playing a central role in that model. Um, yeah. but again, difficult to prove. Yeah. Okay. So if there's one take home message from all uh, this one and the past one and a half hours, we've discussed uh, what's wrong with carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism, uh, protein metabolism. And I think the overarching conclusion is we don't really know a lot. And uh, this is a call for, for collaboration. I think there is more that we should be looking into, more research. And as Andre always says, we can never really uh, make any conclusions unless we do you know, the, the good RCTs and uh, um, uh, clinical trials. To, to, to drive, um, uh, to, to find solutions to, to these uh, questions. So um, I guess I would like to thank all the panelists that we have, that's all. It's already uh, one and a half hours. So uh, thank you to all our panelists uh, and to all of you who attended this webinar. I give it back to Alexandra uh, for our final um, remarks. Impressing uh, time management, Brian. Uh, so thanks a lot. We are just about out of time, so uh, I will uh, I will wrap this up. But uh, also um, join you in uh, adding my uh, my thanks to the, the panelists. You are all very busy. You are all in different places in the world, uh, and you made time for this. We we really really appreciate. Um, so we are planning to actually continue uh, this series in uh, in early uh, 2021. 
So um, stay tuned for more uh, for more information. I think uh, Brian gave us a, hint, a bit of a hint on albumin and uh, talking more about it. So if you want to hear more about the upcoming uh, Quashoko webinars, follow the, the Feinstein International Center's Twitter account or join the e-list. Um, but I guess now after the third webinar, most of you um, know about it. Uh, so if you don't join it, uh, this information is, uh, is at the bottom of uh, the slides you can see. If there are questions that um, you didn't ask uh, and that we did not get to, um, send them uh, over to um, me or the relevant person. So you can see on this slide my email address and the email addresses of the panelists um, on the slide. And um, as a follow up, we will also share the webinar recording with you as soon as it's uh, ready. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your participations and your questions uh, and, your, uh, and your patience. And um, have a good weekend. And this concludes our webinar for today. Thanks a lot and goodbye.